Mike Johnson sucks. All these bills suck. We'll talk about that tonight. There's not going to be an impeachment like I told you there wasn't going to. How you can start winning. We'll talk about saving women in America. All that and more coming up on I'm Right. All right, let's deal with the impeachment thing right off the bat before we get to Mike Johnson and all the other craziness. Congressman Chip Roy is about to join us and whatnot. So I know you're upset about the impeachment thing today. In case you're just now turning on the television, there's supposed to be an impeachment trial in the Senate. Chuck Schumer, big cheese in the Senate, said, nah, we're not going to do that. And everyone on the right is very upset about this today. Look, I'm not telling you not to be upset. It's evil, it's bad, it's wrong, it's all those things. However, I will tell you this, and I really don't mean this to be insulting, but I'm rude, so it's probably going to come off as insulting. If you're really upset that they're not going to have an impeachment trial, maybe you're a little naive. I'll just say it this way. When people have been screaming about this all day, I've heard, this is what I've heard, two different things. I've heard, well, the, he has to, the Constitution. I've heard that, and I've heard... Doesn't he, what a hypocrite Chuck Schumer is. He just said he's on camera from a couple years ago saying we have to have a trial. He's a hypocrite. Again, I'm not trying to be mean. That's a little naive. No one cares about the Constitution anymore. You may love it. I love it. It's a wonderful document. Every time you bring up the Constitution, you sound like a child. And I'm not insulting you. I'm not insulting the Constitution. I'm really not. It's a childish notion. Because Chuck Schumer, the other side, they don't care about it. If they don't care about it, in fact, if they hate it, if they have no use for it, then it goes from being this wonderful document that guarantees freedoms to just not a piece of paper. It means nothing. It means nothing. Of course, he didn't care about the Constitution. And no, he doesn't care about hypocrisy either. These people don't stress those things. That's what people on the right stress. Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Am I, are we doing things the right way? Well, we can't become a monster. We can... Communists don't think in these terms. Why do you think? I, mean, I told you that this was going to happen, didn't I? Remember what I said? I came right here on the show, and I told you that if they actually have an impeachment trial, that I will shave in a Fu Manchu mustache. When I went home and told my wife that, she freaked out. She said, you better not. And I said, honey, don't worry. Trust me. There's not going to be an impeachment trial. Now, why did I know that? Because I understand exactly what we're dealing with here. I know who these people are. Stop with these notions of hypocrisy or the Constitution. Those days are in the past. Sad, but they're in the past. We're in a whole different ballgame now. We're in a power ball game, which brings us to Mike Johnson. Now, Mike Johnson, before he became Speaker of the House, was rock solid. Mike Johnson has been on this show. Remember when he came out and said this? The greatest threat to us at the end of the day is our, is our nation's debt. And so we have to get serious about this. You need adults in the room to advance uh, the, the cutting, the limiting of government and getting it back down in its size and scope. And that's what these fights are about. They're worthwhile fights. They have to be done. And again, it's messy sometimes, but that's our process. That's how it works. And today, more foreign aid, more money for them, more money for them, more money for them. No border security, no money for you, because now he's Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Again, I'm angry about it, but I knew this was coming too. One side is fighting, the other is laying down. If we are going to take this country back, we are not going to do it from Washington, D.C. Not from Congress, not from the White House. It's just not going to happen. Now... I will lay out, probably next segment, ways we can take this country back. But before we do that, let's talk to one of the good people there who actually is trying to do some good work, Congressman Chip Roy of Texas. Well, this is all going pretty poorly, but one of the people who's been actually attempting to do some good things for us there is, of course, our friend Congressman Chip Roy of the great state of Texas. Okay, Chip. I know you don't have a ton of good news because it's all kind of crappy out there. So why don't you just update us on what are, where we are on everything. First, let's deal with all the foreign aid stuff. Money for them, money for them. No money for the people who can't afford e eggs anymore. But where are we at with the foreign aid stuff? Yeah, Jesse, uh, you know, here, uh, you know, more uh, you know, typical D.C. swamp stuff coming your way. And, you know. We've been at this now for a while, and we've had continuing resolution after continuing resolution after omnibus bill after omnibus bill, and we never dealt with the border. 
And it was all done with this promise that, okay, guys, don't worry, we'll, we'll do the border. And Ukraine will be the fight. Trust me, that'll be the fight. So here we are, just another Lucy in the football moment, where what we're being told is the bill that we're supposed to allow to go to the floor is a bill that would provide $95 billion in foreign aid, uh, money for Ukraine, money for Israel, money for Taiwan, and some other money for some defense priorities and supplemental. And that that money, uh, we should just bless and have a rule and vote for it, despite the fact there's nothing for the border. You can put aside whether or not we should do it on the merit, right? You can debate whether or not we should spend another dollar in Ukraine at all. A lot of the, the Republican conference doesn't want to do that. But have that debate, that's fine. But we were always promised that we would secure the border of the United States first. That's not happening. And in that $95 billion is about $8 billion, we're told, we're still looking at the text, $8 billion that would be for, we haven't seen the text, let me be clear, $8 billion that would be for money that would go to uh, uh, Ukraine in a kind of, uh, you know, for whatever it wants to use it for, government funding, bureaucrats. Another $9 billion is for humanitarian assistance, which we know could be used to backfill for, you know, Hamas and Gaza and, and used for other nefarious purposes. So yet again, we're doing the bidding of the Democrat Party. There's a reason Chuck Schumer has said it's a great bill. There's a reason that Hakeem Jeffries has said it's a great bill. And there's a reason that Joe Biden has said it's a great bill. It's because it's their bill. I don't understand it, but that's where we are. Okay, Chip, can you explain something conceptually before we get to the FISA stuff and everything else? I understand we don't have 435 Chip Roy's in the House of Representatives. I get that. I understand we don't have a bunch of you on the Republican ticket. I understand that. I get that there are a bunch of weenie losers in our party. I understand that. But these are only Democrat bills, as you've pointed out. And I know that it is the tiniest majority. I, I understand all this. But there have been no Republican priorities at all passed. Chuck Schumer, this is the second time He's bragged about what we passed. Last time he went on the Senate floor and bragged that, that we didn't have to cut a nickel. He, they continuously brag about what we do. Can you explain why this is happening? Uh, one word, fear. And when Republicans operate in fear, fear of shutdown, right? Fear of default on the debt, when you're talking about the debt ceiling increase last year. You know, fear in this case of what happens to Israel, what happens to Ukraine. As I said, I have a lot of, um, you know, a soft spot in my heart for Israel and for making sure we stand with Israel when this president won't, right? This president is basically, you know, thumbing his nose at Israel, leaving Israel and Prime Minister Netanyahu trying to bend for himself when this, you know, administration literally abstained in the Security Council in, in a vote that would force a, 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 you know, a ceasefire or pressure them to ceasefire. And I, you know, I, I want to be able to say, hey, let's throw something here to support Israel when this administration won't. But we tried last night, Jesse, to say, let's just have a singular vote on just Israel. And we were working hard to try to get the, the votes together. Look, there's a lot of Republicans that are skeptical of that. But we tried to work it out and said we could go do that. But, you know, the speaker didn't choose that path. Instead, we're going to go with this bill, which was all pre-cooked. It's the same as the Senate bill for the most part, almost $100 billion dollars. The Defense Department comes in and says, well, if we don't do this, Ukraine will fall. If we don't do this, you know, some battle happened to Israel. So again, back to my point, it's one word, it's fear. We are, you know, we don't govern, but we are operating in a represent, representative body out of fear. And when you do that, you lose. If you signal to the other side, well, no, we're never gonna shut down. Or, oh, well, we will always vote to fund Israel, uh, Ukraine or Israel uh, without respect to the border, right? If we're not going to do a default, we're not going to go there. Every time you do that, you lost all your leverage. So you might as well just quit and give them your voting card. We now have two GOP members who are talking about bouncing Mike Johnson. Now you can bounce him or don't bounce him. I don't give a crap. I don't see anything changing either way. But is Mike Johnson going to be bounced? If he does get bounced, where do we go from here? What's happening with all this? Yeah, I, and I don't know it is my very direct answer on that. Um, I didn't support Cut. vacate McCarthy last fall because of this process. I knew what would happen. There's a funny story. One of my form, uh, a former member, he's a friend of mine, he said after John Boehner was deposed. And look, John Boehner was doing a lot of stuff I didn't like. And Paul Ryan was the speaker. And, and Paul Ryan was doing stupid stuff. Boehner saw this guy in a local diner. And he walked in and he goes, hey, what's wrong, uh, you know, so-and-so? Uh, same crap, different speaker? He said a different word. And, uh, you know, th the reality of this town is that it wants to do the same thing. Here's the good news. We have a bigger block of people now 
who want to say no. A bigger block of people willing to take the arrows of saying, you don't get to keep doing this. We're not winning yet. We may not win fast enough for the iceberg to hit the Titanic, but we are a bigger group of us are grabbing that steering wheel and trying to wrest it away from the establishment blob here that gave you the Pfizer reauthorization with no warrants, that's giving you this massive $95 billion supplemental to continue to perpetuate war with no clear mission and without making sure we have a secure border ourselves, that gave you the massive spending bill that frankly not even a majority of Republicans voted for two weeks ago because it's filled with all sorts of earmarks, ridiculous spending, uh, $200 million for an FBI headquarters after the FBI is being weaponized against the American people and the former president. I could go on and on, Jesse. That's the bottom line. We'll see what happens with the speaker. I'm not interested in chaos for chaos sake. I'm not interested in perpetuating the same crap here, um, but I'm gonna keep fighting on policy and then we'll see what happens on the speaker front. Yeah, I'm glad you talked about us gaining ground, Chip, because as frustrated and angry as I am, as you well know, I've been trying to explain to my audience that we are getting better. Are we gonna get better fast enough? I don't know, but FISA, obviously we're pretty much screwed on that and you can update us there, but FISA was at least a struggle. FISA's never really been a struggle in my lifetime Correct. since FISA came around. And it was, a, it was a struggle this time to get it through. Now, obviously we're turbo screwed with that whole thing, but maybe <laughs> next time we get even better. Am I wrong? Jesse, that's the exact right perspective. And you often have the right perspective and I appreciate it that, you know, I go back and I look at it this way. In 2009, you had the whole Obama fiasco. What happened? The Tea Party comes in. What do you get? You get Marco Rubio instead of Charlie Crist in Florida. Charlie Crist ultimately became the Democrat nominee against uh, Ron DeSantis. And he was the favored you know, candidate for the Republican establishment. So we got Marco Rubio. We got Mike Lee instead of Bob Bennett, the established candidate in Utah. We got uh, Rand Paul instead of Trey Grayson in Kentucky. The next term, we got Ted Cruz instead of David Dewhurst. Then we got the Freedom Caucus founded in 2014. Then we got Donald Trump, who comes in to drain the swamp in 2016. 2020 was a mess. We dealt with the COVID mess. We had a great hearing yesterday, by the way, highlighting all the stupid uh, you know, uh, COVID uh, tyranny. And now fast forward, and now we're dealing with the struggle. We had the fight over the speaker last year. We're building the Freedom Caucus. More eyes are being opened. You're right. We had a 200, 200, 212 to 212 vote on FISA to force a warrant last week. And that's a really big deal. We were able to get reforms, force change, force the question. We're winning. I just, I just don't know if it's fast enough. So everybody out there, take heart. But you got to get out there and get active in primaries, and you got to hold your members accountable. They'll listen if you burn no. their phones down. Uh, Chip, before we let you go, talk about this COVID hearing yesterday because I watched a whole bunch of that. It was outstanding. Yeah, it was great. We had the Surgeon General of Florida, uh, Dr. Latipo. Um, we had uh, Harmi Dillon, and Harmi said a bunch of the litigation on all the lockdowns and the violations of the First Amendment and, and religious liberty and shutting down churches, uh, as well as shutting down individuals' livelihoods. Dr. Latipo testified about you know a lot of the you know crazy issues with the vaccines, about how all of the liability protections for these big pharma companies is perpetuating that stuff, how all of this tyranny and shutting down our our way of life was completely unacceptable and how we need to keep shining a light on it. We had great participation. Thomas Massey asked great questions. We had a wonderful woman who, from Kentucky who her son had gotten you know, behind in school because it was shut down and she started an organization. Look, the American people are waking up. Riley Gaines is fighting back. Chloe Cole fighting the transgender nonsense. Scott Smith, the dad in Loudoun County. Mark Houck telling the FBI to pound sand. Uh, we need the American people to keep standing strong. I'm going to do everything I can to throw sand in the gears up here. We need a stronger Texas. Uh, and I think there are some changes afoot in Austin. So, you know, keep the faith. Uh, you know, we had a secretary of treasury and a vice president dueling in the streets 220 years ago. So, you know, we've been conflicted before. Uh, but what we don't need is spending money we don't have, continuing endless wars, wide open borders, all of this woke DEI nonsense killing our soul. We need to get back to America, the rule of law, secure borders, sovereignty, a military that, that kills people and blows things up. And uh, I'm going to keep giving that narrative out there and hopefully we can convince some people in our direction. But you got to keep the faith. We're called to. You can't quit. Yeah. Amen. Can't quit. Chip, appreciate you as always, brother. God bless. All right. You ready to start winning? You know, we, you, you have the power to affect everything you see out there. And we're going to discuss that. Next, before we discuss that, let's discuss this. As Chip just said, things are getting better, but very, very slowly. And we might not turn the ship in time. We really might not. Financially, 
look, they're not going to write the ship. They're not. Why do you think, look, I'm looking at a headline right here. Gold shining bright like a diamond and could reach 3,000 per ounce. That's from City. Why do you think that is? Why do you think nation states, finance giants, why do you think they're hoovering up all the gold and silver they possibly can right now? Do you think maybe they know something that's coming? You need to do the same. Now, you're not made of money. I understand that. Oxford Gold Group is for normal people. They'll get it in your retirement account to make sure your 401k isn't wiped out. They'll get physical gold or silver, I don't care what color it is, in your possession. They mail it to you. It's easy. You don't need a bank vault for it. It's all anonymous. It's all insured. But it's something in your physical possession. Call Oxford Gold Group. I promise you this. Every day you wake up, you read a new finance headline, you'll sleep a little better at night knowing you did. 833-995-GOLD. Tell them Jesse told you to call. They will take care of you. I promise. I love these guys. 833-995-GOLD. We'll be back. Are you politically involved? You're probably answering yes. You're politically involved. How politically involved are you? Is it just watching I'm Right every night? Not that I want you to stop doing that. Do you maybe have a MAGA hat? Not that I want you to stop doing that. I'm voting Trump. Not that I want you to stop doing that. But is that the extent of your political involvement? I'm going to explain something just very briefly because we're going to move on. We have so much else we need to talk to. But this country will not be saved from Washington. It won't be saved by Congress. It won't be saved by Trump in the White House. It's not possible. It's too broken. It's too corrupt. It's too gone. But this country can be saved by you. If we would engage, we can save the country. And let me explain. Do you know why there's a drag queen story hour in red towns all across the United States of America? Do you understand why, the real reason why? Because the communists are politically involved. We think we are. But they actually are. We vote for president once every four years. We post on social media, I love Trump. But do you go to school board meetings? Do you get on your city parks department, city council? When's the next committee meeting in your town? Your town has one, I promise you, a commission, a committee meeting. When is the next one? Do you even know? All this information is publicly available. The communist does know. He'll be at those meetings. He'll be filling your committee. I know you have a 10,000 person town. And Jesse, you don't understand. We're fine here. There's only 20 communists here. Yes, but the 20 communists are all the ones in power. There is a difference, a monumental difference between majority and power. Those are two totally opposite things. The right thinks they're the same. They are not. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is you can take back that power. The soft underbelly of communism in the United States of America is their hold on local politics. They took your school board, they took your city council, they're on the committees, they're on the commissions, they're in the parks department, but they're so safe there. They feel so safe because you never got involved before. But what if tonight on the way home from work, instead of driving by City Hall, what if you pulled in, found out when the next public meeting was, made a plan, you, 10 friends, to show up, what if that is how we save the United States of America? Because that is. You know that? Get involved. That's how we'll save the country. Actually involved. All right? All right. Now, save yourself as well. Save yourself from physical harm. I am sad that I even have to come on the air and talk about this, but the truth is you really need to keep a burn a pistol launcher on you at all times. You really genuinely do. A burn a pistol launcher should be on you when you drive. It should be by your bed when you sleep. If you're out for a jog, if you're walking the dog, it should be on you. This is a non-lethal pistol launcher. It shoots pepper balls or tear gas balls. It will stop a very, very bad, very violent man in his tracks. And you need one of these things. It's legal in all 50 states. So you can't, oh, Jesse, I can't, I'm in California. It's legal in all 50 states, no background checks, no permits. They will mail it to you. SWAT teams across America 
are using Berna products. These things are the highest quality and it will save your life. 10% off at Berna.com slash Jesse. We'll be back. And so as I speak to people in my state or around the country, it's very clear abortion is not just on the ballot in places like Arizona and Florida. It is on the ballot in all 50 states. Yeah, we have a problem in this country. We love abortion, and that is a problem. It's a despicable, demonic act to harm the unborn. It is at any stage, any stage. It's despicable, it's disgusting, and yet in American culture today, they love it. They love it so much, Democrats campaign on it almost exclusively. Joining me now, Abby Roth, big fan, creator of Classically Abby. Abby, how, how do we get to a place in the country where it's not even a left-right thing anymore? Half the right has joined them. It's just, well, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, well, maybe 15 weeks, I don't know. Just butcher it here. Oh, that's fine. How, how do we turn into such cowards with the most defenseless among us. I don't understand that, I don't get it. I think it really comes down to the idea that people are devoted to themselves over everything else. The idea of expressive individualism, which, which Carl Truman writes about, Carl S. Truman writes about in his books. I mean, the idea that you are most important and it doesn't matter if it comes at the cost of a life, it doesn't matter if it comes at the cost of anything, you need to put yourself first. And so you see people on the right and the left putting women who are making poor choices, right? Because how the high 90% of abortions, I don't know if that's the correct percentage, but a, the most majority of abortions are done because women just want to do them. It's not, there's an emergency, it's not for any other reason than, oh, I slept with someone and now I don't want this baby. Because of that, we have people, women, just getting rid of their children's lives. And the truth is that a woman who aborts her baby isn't a mother, it isn't not a mother. She is a mother. It's that she's a mother to a dead child, which I feel so sorry for these women that they don't know it until they do it. Because we know that there's a like post-abortion syndrome of women realizing, oh, I've made a terrible, terrible mistake, but you can't know it until you've done it in this culture, unfortunately. It's not something we can just tell people anymore. And really all of this stemmed from when birth control became so easily accessible, right? Because as soon as you have birth control easily accessible, women can say, I don't need to relate sex with having a baby. Sex and you know, pregnancy are completely separate ideas which of course is not true because even when you're taking abort uh, the even when you're taking birth control there's a very high chance that you could get pregnant or a small chance or whatever kind you know de depending on what kind of birth control you're using so once we've mentally separated birth uh, separated sex from pregnancy then when you have irresponsible sex and you get pregnant you're like well i guess i might as well just get rid of this baby Abby, I, I need to ask you a question because I'm not a woman and you very much are one. I, I believe that God makes us with certain instincts. I just believe we're created that way. As a man, I'm, I have instincts to protect certain things. As a woman, maybe I'm just blessed to have a great mother, and I did. My wife, I watch what she does for our sons. Like She'll kill herself just, just to make sure they have a good birthday party or something like that. There's nothing she wouldn't do to them. I think about women and their babies as... Women will lay down and die for their babies. In nature, it's like this. Grizzly bears will die. They do all the time, protecting their young. Yet, what happened to American women or women of the West? And I'm not absolving men. I'm really not. But how is that not just something built in? Whatever you, the actress tells you or the latest Democrat politician, how is that? I always thought it was built in. Clearly, I was wrong. You know, I think it has. it comes down to a culture of, of irresponsibility. When you, as a mother, yes, there is absolutely an inherent innate connection to your child. But even for a lot of women I know who have had children and you know have children here, it's hard for them to, to understand how important that role is, right? Because I've talked to so many women, I'm a stay at home mom with my two sons and I will tell people, you know, I love being home with them. I'm considering homeschooling. And they're like, oh, I can't imagine being home with my kids all day. I could never. I could never do that. And so of course they still absolutely adore their kids, but there's this there's this element of like 
we've really divorced women from motherhood. We've made women afraid of being mothers, of being completely responsible for their children. And so they kind of eschew that responsibility for everything we've been raised to do instead, fulfill our potential by going out and getting a job or going out and pursuing our dreams. When being a mother is the best thing you can do and it is really it fulfills every dream and fulfills every potential of women and unfortunately we've really we've really come into a, an era a time where women are not taught that they're taught that being a mother only holds you back and even if you are a mother you can this is a, a phrase i've heard a lot lately which is oh you can be a mother and pursue your dreams that's even used on the pro life side and i i like it as an as an idea but the truth is a lot of the time being a mother can preclude following your dreams because your child is more important than whatever you've been told is your dream and your child becomes your dream and that is a beautiful concept that we that we really have lost yeah it really it's something that you see all the time out there you don't have to choose no actually you do have to choose oftentimes you very much do have to choose okay that's that's women let's talk about men men have a very important role in this discussion they should not remove themselves in this discussion they should not bow before these dirty commie baby hating women <laughs> when it comes to this discussion men have an important role to protect these children Young men today, young men I talk to all the time, they email my show, they don't want to be dads, Abby. Now, I talk all the time about how great it is to be a dad, even though I'm, I suck at it. I, I love it. Why don't young men want to be dads? I think they're afraid of, of women. <laughs> I think they're afraid huh. yeah. that women are going to tell them they're doing it wrong. We are, you know, the again, the culture we live in is very pro-female, even though you're going to hear the antithesis of that on the left. And so women are, are often put in a position of being like, oh, you're doing it wrong. Oh, you're not a good enough father. Oh, you're not, you're not doing things right. And that's not true. Men are different than women as it should be. Fathers are incredibly important to their children for the and for the opposite reasons that women are, right? Women are there to nurture and take care of their children. And fathers are there to put risk into their lives and play with them and make it like a little dangerous so that their kids know they can take risks and still live. And a lot of women don't wanna see that. So they're telling their husbands, you're doing it wrong. You're doing everything wrong. And so men look at you know their dads who maybe are, are not able to in, interact with their children in that masculine way. And maybe they're seeing, oh, I, this doesn't look like a lot of fun. It looks like I would have to be feminized as a father and that doesn't look fun. Whereas with my husband, you know, fatherhood is so much fun for him because I'm like, yeah, like throw our kid on the floor. That's hilarious. Like he loves it. He loves being thrown in the air. He loves scraping his knee. He loves not being completely uh, in a bubble and protected all the time. But that's what fathers can bring. I think that's an element. I also think that a lot of guys, they don't know that, that parenthood is fun. We've been shown, right, that again, this is on women for women and men, we've been shown this, this picture that parenthood is the end of your fun, that you don't get to do things on your own schedule anymore. You don't get to have have nights out and you don't get to, you know, it's it's a it, it feels like an end rather than a beginning, right? Having children is so much the beginning of your life, not the end at all. And I recently heard something that I thought was just so moving is that a lot of the times, even now for men who do have children, for women who do have children, we think of it as a stage of life. We think of it as, oh, you have your, your young kids, so maybe you only have two, so that this stage of life is short. And then you can get back into your, your normal life, your normal life of being able to go out and party whenever you want. Of course, it's going to be a little different with kids in this, as you get older, but it's, it's you know more on your own schedule rather than a way of life, that having children is a way of life. And that's why there are some people out there who I totally respect and I hope to be among them who, who just continuously have children because they think of it as a way of life, not a stage of life. And it's not like, oh, I just need to get through this so that I can get back to my normalcy. Yeah. Being a dad is the best thing I ever did. Abby, I would talk to you all day if I could, but I cannot. I appreciate you very much. Thank you so Abby much Roth. for having me. All right. We're going to talk to somebody who used to be that liberal white woman we talk about all the time. That nut job woman, the dirty commie who's destroying the country, and she woke up. What's her story? How'd she wake up? How'd she start? 
talk about that in a moment. Before we talk about that, let's talk about this. <clears throat> there are three things, three things you never shortchange yourself on in life. Three things. You know what those three things are? Your tires on your vehicle. Your life depends on it. The life of your family. The life of families around you. Buy good tires. Your bedding. You spend a third of your life in bed. And anything that goes on your feet. Your feet are everything. That's why I talk to you about gravity defiers. What is it? Well, first of all, you need to understand custom orth orthopedics. That's what comes with gravity to fire. Custom orthopedics. Your feet are different than my feet. Your feet hurt at the end of the day, whether you're chasing the kids around or walking on your job or whatever. Your feet hurt on the, and at the end of the day because they're not made for your feet. They're made for everyone's feet. Go experience something totally different. No foot pain, no aching at the end of the day. Go and save a bunch of money while you do it. G-D-E-F-Y dot com, promo code JESSE. These are the greatest shoes you will ever put on your feet. You're going to end up buying 10 pair, okay? G-D-E-F-Y, promo code JESSE. We'll be back. It is crazy how crazy things are. I know that's a terrible way to put that, but on, on, think about this. Think about this for a moment. We now live in a country, the year 2024, where dudes beat up women in sports regularly. That's, this is something that happens regularly. And I shouldn't laugh because it's not funny. That one MMA chick got her skull beaten in. High school volleyball girl still has concussion problems. Some dude spiked a ball off of her face. This happens in front of our eyes regularly. And not only is there no outrage about it, everyone's just kind of moved on. I mean, the mainstream people, I know you're mad about it. President put out a statement yesterday. Women in sports continue to push new boundaries that inspire us all. But right now we're seeing that even if you're the best, Women are not paid their fair share. It's time we give our daughters the same opportunities as our sons and ensure women are paid what they deserve. Joining me now, Jennifer Gilardi, culture, health, and policy writer. Jennifer, president is very, very concerned about women, especially in sports, getting equal treatment, isn't he? Uh, yeah, well, if he was, then he'd, you know, say something about the men and women's sports, but he doesn't. He celebrates the day of transgender visibility on a very sacred holy day for many of us so um they don't seem to be too concerned with equality they are they have a different different definition of it to be sure jennifer doesn't it seem like i only have my perspective as a dude but as a woman <laughs> does it seem like this stuff happened fast hey i i'm only 42 years old i'm not ancient and life was really normal for most of my life. And now there are dudes with penises in women swimming. I don't understand. When, doesn't this seem like it happened instantly? It does until you look back. And I wrote a piece actually in the Epoch Times um, entitled Save the Tomboys, How Decades of Liberal Sexual Ideology is Erasing Women. And so if you trace it back, um, it's not the first wave feminist movement. Obviously, that was a worthwhile pursuit to allow women to vote, uh, to make sure we weren't defined as property anymore of our husbands. But it was really that third wave feminism that no longer celebrated women for being women and, and our unique capabilities and being mothers and wives and having the ability to go in the workforce. But it really, it, it, uh, Harvey Mansfield wrote this book called Manliness, and he talks about it, it went from this desire to protect women and to stand up for what women can bring to the table to this this desire to like that women can be anything. Right. There are no boundaries for women anymore. We can be anything and even nothing that that our actual thing that makes us feminine is is worth nothing anymore. We can have sex like a man. We can work like a man. Um, so it's this kind of progressive ideology of there are no boundaries, there is no truth. I just heard, saw a, a Twitter post of Catherine Mayer, I think her name is, the new CEO of, of um, NPR, saying something about there are many truths. And I, well, there's not many truths. There is one truth and then there are personal experiences and personal stories. 
Um, and I am now probably fulfilling every stereotype of a single woman with my cat in the background. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, I knew your, that was going to happen. Cat just is, <laughs> your cat is. Your you just stay where you are. Your cat is more than welcome to join the broadcast, and if it has anything to add, it is welcome to do so. Uh, you know what? Actually, let me ask you your yeah. story because you're you're kind of a convert to this way of thinking over the last few years give us your story yeah i am um, i grew up pretty conservative in uh in a small town in in kind of blue collar pennsylvania everybody knows it because of the office i grew up in scranton um my grandfather was a coal miner um and you know my dad was kind of a star football player at Penn State and went into insurance, very typical middle class, maybe upper middle class at that point, like we'd probably be considered poor at this point. Um, but, uh, yeah. and pretty much upper middle class, good public school education. And there was definitely a focus to achieve and to do well. And I um, played varsity tennis, I was a dancer, um, went on to a very conservative school in the South in Virginia. Um, but I think part of me was kind of on this active pursuit of fulfillment. Like I was seeking something and I wasn't finding it in the outside world, but I kept going there for it. Um, and I rebelled a little bit. I, I, you know, if the things that my parents were telling me were true, I think I wanted to find those things out for myself. I didn't want to just take anybody's word for it. And so I felt very constrained kind of by this potentially, I guess we want to say conservative, it felt it felt very binding, right? We talk about boundaries, but this to me at that time felt very binding and do this, go be, I was going to, I was ready to go to law school. That's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, my actual undergrad is in public policy. I worked in DC for a summer and I said, no, thank you. Um, and then I moved to Alabama, which is also pretty conservative, I moved to Birmingham. And then I, you know, was still seeking and I went where everybody goes when they're seeking, which is Los Angeles. Um, and I, you know, if you don't have a, a solid sense of self, if you don't have um, a true understanding of who you are and what you want, you can get very lost there very easily, very pulled into the progressive ideology. And that's what happened. Like I was perfect. I was perfect fodder for the left, right? Someone who was seeking who probably wanted attention. And I talk about this um, in my piece in The Federalist. I think we have a lot of women walking around with daddy issues. Um, you know, I think women want to be adored. They want to be loved. They have this nurturing quality. They have this empathetic quality that can be taken advantage of by the left. So all of those things um, really put me in prime position to be brainwashed for more, um, for the most part. And then, I was out there and in other liberal cities, New York and Austin for about 20 years. I mean, way fast forwarding to um, COVID. And I made a career out of kind of health and wellness. I was an on-camera personality. I got all these degrees. I was deep into the yoga world, deep into spirituality, trips to India, following a guru. I mean, it, it was a cult for sure. Um, the more I even learn about what was going on behind the scenes, the more confident I am in saying that I was in a spiritual cult. Um, and I kind of started coming out of that right before COVID and then COVID hit and something just did not feel right. Like for all I knew about health and nutrition and particularly when we started to see the data and who was dying, um, it just didn't feel right to me. I, I the red flag really went off when people started rushing to the store for toilet paper and I'm like, what? This is just illogical. What the heck is going on? And you're telling me at the time I lived in Topanga Canyon, which is just this beautiful enclave in Los Angeles near Malibu in the mountains. And you're telling me I can't go to the beach. I mean, you saw, I'm sure there were surfers that got pulled out of the water and arrested. And I saw people jumping to the other side of the street with masks on. And that just <laughs> like, red went off. I think all the training I had, you know, what I say is my conservative upbringing probably saved me, right? So so logic finally started to kick in again. Um, and then I really went down the rabbit hole. There was another incident that happened around the George Floyd stuff. And, you know, it's a kind of a longer story, but it made me see the, the hypocrisy of the left, really. 
um, and it around the whole Black Lives Matter thing and 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 where people were getting their information and and how biased they were about it. Um, and Candace Owens has a part in that story, you know. So that that was interesting, and um, I had no idea who she was when I first heard her. But so I. I you know, we were in lockdowns and I took a lot of hikes around my neighborhood because that's pretty much all I can do. And I was listening to Joe Rogan podcast and Jordan Peterson podcast. And then I I just started to kind of wake up like a lot of people, I think. I think COVID in a way was somewhat of a blessing for people. Um, for a lot of parents, they saw what was happening in schools. Um, for, for some people kind of living in this la-la land of rainbows and unicorns out in Los Angeles, that everything is not rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> Um, and then I kind of decided, you know, I'm really interested in truth. I think I always have been. I think that's ultimately what led me to seek things. And I just, what I was doing in my career prior didn't feel meaningful enough anymore. And, and I know I, I've helped a lot of people. I've had a lot of people reach out to me and, and, and compliment me on my work and I've helped them and, and that was great, but. I think I had reached the point in my career where I'd done everything I was going to do. And there was something going on here that was bigger. And I decided to go back to get my master's in public policy at Pepperdine University, which was right up the street from me, which was very convenient. Um, and that program, what we had to read, the books, we the great books we had to read, right? It was like a great books program. Um, so Aristotle, uh, a book by Matthew Crawford was really wonderful. And I read, I kind of gobbled his stuff up and reading and listening and having conversations with people. And then I came to realize like, wow, this side of the aisle is a lot more fun, first of all. And I'm back in reality and I can laugh again. And not everything has to be so serious and I don't have to save the world. And along with that, I went back to Christianity. So it was like all of these things, like that that weight, that burden that Jesus took off my shoulders of needing to be the savior of the world, because someone already did that. I mean, it, it was just a massive transformation. And what I want to emphasize about that is that like, I think right now this goes beyond, what we're seeing now goes beyond kind of Marxist ideology. It goes beyond the woke mind virus. I think there's a deep spiritual sickness and that's in the heart and no amount of logic. This is where I think conservatives sometimes miss the boat. There's no amount of logic that's going to appeal somebody that is to, to change their mind that is spiritually sick. Um, you can have these wake up calls. I think COVID was one of them, but I just think we are ill right now and it's a deep illness and it's beyond, like I said, this mind virus. Although that plays a part of it. Yeah. No, I 100% I agree with you. We're dealing with good and evil, not Republicans and Democrats. And there's there's just so yeah. much, there's something so much bigger and deeper going on here that's well beyond you and well beyond me. But I love your story, Jennifer. You come back and join me soon. I'm out of time or else I'd keep you here for another 20 oh, minutes. You are the Sorry, best. You are any the questions. Best. No, no. You are the best. You are the best. Come on back. I'll have you back again soon. All right. Okay. Now, lighten the mood. We have a great light in the media. You know what's Second Amendment Day? Next. All right, let's lighten the mood. And today, did you know today was Second Amendment Day? The amendment that actually guarantees all of our other freedoms. Did you know it's not actually a piece of paper that does it? It's the Second Amendment that does it. That's the only reason you're not in a gulag as we speak. And in honor of the Second Amendment, we're going to honor one Bob Munden. He died back in 2012. And this dude, I used to watch his videos all the time. I still see him on occasion when I'm online and I stop and watch every single time this dude starts busting. And I'm telling you, this guy's fast. Ladies and gentlemen, the fastest gun in the world right here. Bob, you are quick. Well, the first reaction that people have when they see this draw is, now wait a minute, are you, could you really hit anything doing that? Right. Well, let me show you my own way with a target that that is indeed out of the holster. Let me set this target up. I'll shoot about eight feet away because I'm shooting blanks now. Here we go. Now, in terms of time, Bob, how quick was that? 
I draw cock level, fire this gun, hit what I'm shooting at in less than two one hundredths of one second. Okay, two shots going to sound like one, and he's going to hit both of the balloons. It still sounded like just one shot to me, On the other but hand. both of the bullets are gone. That dude was amazing. And th that's one little one. We could have done the whole hour, just Bob Munden videos. Anyway, rest in peace, sir. Happy Second Amendment Day to everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.